leading our session today, we have Mark Dolinar, and he's one of our application engineers with our 3D printing team. Now, Mark started his career in a mechanical engineering group designing heavy equipment for the transportation industry. Uh, his experience using SolidWorks led him to us where he could focus 100% of the time on SolidWorks tools. And some of his specialties were obviously the CAD, the core competency, but also simulation and CAM. And while teaching CAM, he learned about how manufacturers are taking advantage of 3D printed parts to do things like build tooling and fixtures. And at that point, Mark really saw the potential in 3D printing and was recently promoted to the 3D printing team. Now, Mark's depth of knowledge of both SolidWorks and 3D printing makes him a perfect presenter for a session on SolidWorks tools for better 3D prints. Mark? Awesome. Uh, thank you, Tim. And good morning, everyone. I'm pleased to present to you uh, today about some of the various tools found inside of SolidWorks that can help us to produce better 3D printed parts. Uh, right now, I'm actually broadcasting live from our Redmond, Washington digital manufacturing lab. In this side of this lab, we actually have access to quite a few high-end uh, 3D printers. You can see right behind me, I actually have the HP 580. I have a 4200 HP as well, and a Mark Forge X7. So, easy to say, I have a lot of access to these 3D printers. I'm able to try a lot, out a lot of parts and see exactly how these design tools and how these rules can actually play into 3D printing. And that's what we see a lot in the industry. Um, as more and more companies begin to adopt 3D printing, the value in understanding how to actually design parts for 3D printing become more and more trans uh, apparent. And that actually leads me to the first thing that I usually get questioned on. Why do we even have to design parts for 3D printing? The whole purpose behind 3D printing is to have rule-less design. Instead of being constrained by a set of rules that you would normally have within like a milled part or injection molding, 3D printing is supposed to open up the doors and give you unlimited options. And to a certain extent, that is true. However, with 3D printing, there are certain design rules that if held in check, will actually produce better parts that have nicer surface finishes, are produced much faster, and for a lot less cost. And that's a big one, especially with 3D printing materials. Sometimes the material cost can be quite pricey. So if you're printing out extra supports or extra areas of the part that you're not really utilizing, you're just making a lot more work for yourself in either the post-processing realm or just waiting for those parts to be established. So having good design intent upfront with your parts can actually save you a lot of time in the long run. Now, one of the things I usually like to teach in my classes is the funnel approach to designing. So each and every one of you has some sort of a goal you're trying to create or trying to reach with your actual part production. Now, to reach that goal, you'll first have to choose a manufacturing method, whether that be a CNC machine, injection molding, or additive manufacturing. Well, in this case, we're going to be choosing additive manufacturing, but then that leads us to the next level. There's a variety of different printers on the market, from SLS, SLA, FDM, and multi-jet fusion units. Each and every one of those printers has their own unique capabilities and printer limitations that, when narrowed down, will give you a certain set of design rules to follow in order to create the optimal part. And in this particular webinar, I actually chose to talk about fused filament fabrication, otherwise known as FFF. This is one of the most readily available 3D printing technologies on the market. The premise behind FFF is you'll have some sort of a nozzle that extrudes a material, whether that be PLA, ABS, or onyx. When it's extruding the material, it'll actually build directly on a build bed and add material only to where features are required. It does this layer by layer, stacking one on top of each other until you have your finished part. Now, in my particular case, I'm fortunate enough to have a Mark Forge X7 in our office. So that's the printer I'm actually gonna be designing my parts around. For that particular printer, we actually have a build volume we'll have to work with, layer height, and the technology. In this case, because I'm using the X7, we also have the ability to do continuous filament fabrication, which basically means that I can use 
either a carbon fiber sort of uh, filament or a fiberglass filament to reinforce the parts and make them stronger. So we'll be using that when we're designing parts. But before we get into the part design, I first want to show the part that we're going to be looking at for the majority of this webinar. And this is going to be a handlebar riser for a motorcycle. Traditionally, this is a part that would be machined. However, as these printer technologies become more and more advanced, we can start pushing some of these traditionally machined parts towards additive to make lighter designs, free up space on our shop floor, and just make the overall design process that much smoother. Now, this leads me into the very first tool to use inside of SOLIDWORKS. And you'll notice that a lot of the tools that I'm gonna be recommending are gonna be tools that might be based upon a different manufacturing method, but can be adapted to 3D printing. The first one is Design for Manufacturing Express. This is a tool that was created by Camworks, the company that wrote SOLIDWORKS CAM. Now, the tool itself is supposed to identify manufacturing design errors within your parts. Now, these errors can either make it very expensive and costly to machine or build, or even impossible. Some of the things that it's able to identify are deep pockets or slots, inaccessible features, sharp corners, or even filleted edges on the outside. Now, DFM Express is a free tool that's available in every license of SOLIDWORKS. If you haven't used it just yet, I would highly recommend taking a look at it. I use this quite extensively whenever I take a prototype part and I want to get it manufactured or built, whether that is 3D printing or even machining. To find this tool, what we're going to do is go to the Command Manager. I'll jump to the Evaluate tab. And then on the far right-hand side of the screen, you'll see the DFM Express Analysis Wizard. Once you load the tool, the first thing I like to do is go directly into the Settings menu. The Settings menu will allow you to analyze the part based upon the manufacturing method you wish to use, whether that be a mill, a sheet metal part, injection molding, or even a turn part. Next, you can actually adjust all the parameters based upon your shop or the shop that's actually manufacturing the part. This is gonna be based around criteria such as like the length of your tools or what the shop has the capabilities of doing. After you're done setting this up, we can hit run. And DFM Express is actually going to analyze the part and show any potential issues that might cause problems when you go to manufacture this piece. Now you'll notice that it's found three individual rules that have failed the particular parameters that I've set up. The first of which is actually a hold depth. Whenever you click on these rules, you'll actually have a flyout window that shows you what the rule is and what the ratio of the rule that was broken. In this case, there's a counterbore hole that's actually quite deep. So it might be very difficult to have a end mill or a drill actually machine this out without the holder coming into contact with the part. Definitely something to think about in this particular design. We also have a couple of other errors, such as a partial hole. Might be hard to actually keep the tolerance on this without the drill bit wandering or the end mill wandering. And then also we have the fillets on the outside corner. Again, the end mill might try to wander as it's going around and trying to machine that. These two on the outside are pretty simple to fix. If you want, you can put a chamfer or box off that corner. However, we'll notice that this counterbore hole on the front is a little bit more challenging due to the fact that this is probably a cosmetic feature. We could go back through and redesign the part, but in our case, because we do wanna use the additive manufacturing approach, this is kind of one of those validation tools that we can use to try to determine whether or not this is a good candidate to use additive with or just to continue with our traditional manufacturing. DFM Express is a tool I use quite extensively, and we also are gonna see a little bit later on in this webinar an alternative method of using DFM Express when looking at a 3D printed part. Now, because we're choosing to use additive in order to manufacture this part, there are a couple of things that we need to keep in mind. First, the loading conditions of the part are critical. In this case, because it's the handlebar riser, 
we need to make sure that this part is not going to fail or else whoever's riding that bike may lose control. The material is another factor. We need to choose a material that will hold up to the conditions of the loading. Next up, tolerancing and critical dimensions will have to be held in check. In general, all the critical dimensions should be kept on the XY plane. Anything that's printed in the Z direction is not gonna have as good of tolerance. It'll be okay, but not as good as the XY. We'll then look at things such as surface quality, and these holes, and then self-supporting angles. Now, in our case, because we're choosing to use fused filament fabrication for our manufacturing method, one of the big things that we need to keep in mind are the material properties of the prints. That is, the prints are anisotropic. The prints itself are actually gonna display and exhibit different material and physical properties in various directions. Now, in general, the plane that is parallel to the build bed will be much stronger than the plane that is perpendicular. In this particular scenario, you'll see that the Z direction is the plane that's perpendicular. Now, this is something that's extremely important to remember, especially when you're using FFF as your manufacturing technique. Because when you load up the part, you do not want to load in the direction that the part is the weakest. And a lot of the times I'll see this, especially when you're looking at failed 3D prints. The material itself is strong enough to hold up to the forces, but just not in the orientation that that part is built. You'll see right here, we have a failed 3D print where the design itself was loaded on the top and the bottom. And it just so happened that was the exact same direction that the print was actually built on. Now, what that leads to is the ability for your part to actually shear in between the layers of your 3D print and ultimately fail. Now, in this case, that material was strong enough to actually hold up to the force, but because we loaded it in the direction that the part was weakest, we ended up with a failed print. And that's something that we don't, definitely don't wanna do. We don't wanna take all the time to design the part, print the part, test the part, only to have it fail for something as simple as this. And that brings me into the next tool that's available inside of SolidWorks. That's gonna be our simulation tool. The first thing that we're gonna to have to do is actually identify what direction we're predicting loading to be in. And you'll notice in here, for this handlebar riser, it's actually kind of simple to see. If I'm riding the, down the road on this motorcycle and I pull back or push forward, I'm expecting that to be pretty much the only loading condition that this particular part is gonna have. However, again, I always like to validate my designs before I go forward and actually produce the parts. And that's where a tool such as Simulation Express comes in. Now this tool is actually a first pass stress analysis tool that will allow me to load the part and determine whether or not the material is gonna actually hold up to the actual load and what direction the force is gonna go in. Now, in our particular case, because we are using 3D printing, we need to take this with a grain of salt in that when you simulate a part, it's actually simulating it as one solid block, whereas a 3D printed design actually has various layers that are stacked on top of one another. So the results from our simulation are gonna be good, but don't take this as a surefire way of making sure that this part will always work. Have this as a stepping stone in other design decisions. Now, in our case, I wanna double check and make sure that A, the material that I'm choosing to use, in this case, Onyx for the Mark Forge, is going to hold up to our load. And I wanna to try to determine what direction that load is gonna be applied to. To find the Simulation Express tool, all we'll have to do is jump to the Evaluate tab. And on the far right-hand side of the screen, you'll see the Simulation Express Analysis Wizard. Again, this tool is available in every single seat of SOLIDWORKS. And I really like this tool because it allows you to get fairly accurate results with little to no simulation experience. This is due to the fact that Simulation Express is actually gonna tell you exactly what it needs from you in order to run the simulation properly directly from this task pane. We'll go ahead and click on next and begin the process of simulating our piece. The first thing it's gonna ask us for is a fixture. And this is actually important because currently this part is floating inside a 3D space. We're gonna to have to tell the software exactly where we're expecting this part to be mounted 
so that as we apply a load, it's actually gonna simulate the load in the proper orientation. For us, because this is going to be the handlebar riser, all I'm gonna do is fix the bottom face here and assume that this is going to be bolted directly to the top of the forks. Once we have our fixture in place, we can click on next to apply the force. In this particular scenario, I'm just gonna apply the force to this center circular hole. Now, if you take a look at the force vector arrows that I've just applied, notice that the force isn't actually being applied in just one direction, rather across the entire surface evenly as if it was a pressure. Not really exactly what we need to simulate. In order to fix this problem, I can actually direct the force in one way by using this selected direction option. What this will allow me to do is either choose a face or a plane in order to direct the force to, so that now the force is simulating or very close to what I would expect it to be in real life. I'll then go through and apply about a thousand foot pounds of torque and click OK. The last thing we'll have to do before we actually run the simulation is check the material. And in our case, because I'm using Onyx as the material, it does not come default inside of the material library. However, SolidWorks does give you this custom materials folder where you can go through and add any of your custom materials that you would like directly inside. The great thing about using simulation is the simulation software will actually tell you what material properties it needs to have in order to have an accurate simulation uh, made. So anything that it shows up in red inside of this material properties menu is necessary for the simulation to run. If you plug in those values for the particular 3D printing material you're choosing to use, click on apply and close. It'll update the material and allow you to go on and actually run that simulation. All that's left for us to do is sit back and wait as it analyzes our part and tries to determine whether or not the part itself is going to hold up inside of our particular scenario. The first screen that we see is actually a deformation screen where it's going to play an animation that's exaggerating exactly what the force is going to do to the part. At this screen, if your part behaves oddly or not how you would expect, you could actually go back, reposition the load or reposition the force in order to make sure that your simulation results are working properly. In our case, this is kind of what I would expect it to do. So I'm gonna click on yes to continue and work on from here. Now the next options will have various result menus that show up, such as von Mises stress, displacement, and factor of safety. Factor of safety is actually very powerful because it actually allows you to determine the yield stress of the actual material divided by the actual stress applied to the part, meaning that anything that falls below one is guaranteed to fail. Above one, you can actually determine what the factor of safety is to determine how likely it would be to fail in the long run. In our case, by using this factor of safety menu, we can validate the part in two ways. First of which, by just analyzing the part, anything that shows up in red is going to be an area where the factor of safety does not meet our minimum of one. We can also see down below that our factor of safety says that the minimum value is 2.26. And this reaffirms that the material we're choosing to use for this part will be up to par. Again, pay attention. The simulation software is going to predict or assume that our part is a solid block of this Onyx material, whereas we're printing this. So it's not really a solid block, rather various layers of the Onyx material. So that's where we'll come into our next menu that will allow us to show the von Mises stress. The von Mises stress is going to allow us to show the direction that the stress is being applied to, as well as any potential stress risers that can arise. You'll notice that down below, there's actually an area here where we have some stress risers. We can choose to modify that design, maybe add a fillet in order to relieve some of that stress. But because our factor of safety far exceeds our minimum, I'm gonna assume that that is okay. Now, the simulation tools are very, very good in allowing us to validate our actual design process and make sure everything will hold up in the real world. Now, we've double checked and make sure that the material will hold up. 
However, how do we orient the part? As we saw in a previous slide, the orientation of the part is actually critical to make sure that it will actually hold up in the real world with these loaded conditions. Now, if I were to look at this part, a quick and easy way of printing it would just be in the vertical direction. This actually solves a lot of issues. It minimizes support and makes sure that all of my surfaces have good surface finish quality, but we might not be able to hold up to the loading conditions that we have in place. The reason being is the layer lines of that particular 3D print are actually gonna be going in the exact same direction as our load. What that ultimately means is we're loading this part up in its weakest direction, just asking for the part to actually fail. Now, of course, we could test and validate this in the real life to double check to make sure that it wouldn't fail, but I don't wanna do that. I wanna make sure that I'm setting this part up in its strongest possible orientation. That is to say that we're going to print the part in the exact same direction that the load is going to be applied to. In this case, just laying the part down on its side and printing it upwards. By doing this, the actual load is going to be in line and parallel to the individual layers of your 3D printed part, making that part much stronger and less likely to fail in the long run. So by using that simulation tool, we've just validated that the material will hold up and we've double checked to make sure that we're printing it in the proper orientation so it's the strongest where the load is actually being applied to the part. Now, one thing to note, and this is a tool that I'll use quite often for more complex designs, is a stress tensor plot. Now, the stress tensor plot is actually available in Simulation Premium. And what you can do with this is actually show the force vector arrows of the direction where the forces are gonna be applied to. What this does is allows you to more easily align your part on the print bed parallel to the direction of the force. Very, very powerful tool. It is not available in SOLIDWORKS Simulation Express, but it's available in SOLIDWORKS Simulation Professional. Along with Simulation Professional, there's a variety of other simulation tools that you can use to validate all of your other designs, whether that's for 3D printing, injection molding, or even just a simple CNC machined part. Definitely a lot of tools that are available here. We'll actually link a handout of the simulation overview slide for you guys to review. If you have any questions about any of the various simulation tools that SOLIDWORKS has to offer, or if you would like to contact us about potentially consulting with a simulation project, please make sure to reach out and ask. Now, one final thing I wanted to talk about is what happens if you can't print in that optimal orientation? Now, in this case, I actually have a foot control off that same motorcycle. You'll notice that with the foot control, I'm actually going to be kicking it in the exact same direction as the layer lines would be. Now, the reason being, there's not really a better way of actually printing that part. If I rotate it at any other angle, I'm actually going to be adding additional support material, which would ultimately mean that the part is going to have very poor surface finish. So in this case, I'm kind of forced to print it in this one orientation. But that doesn't mean that the part itself is going to have to fail. So one trick that you guys can use in your designs to strengthen up parts that are printed in a not optimal you know, print orientation is by adding either a press fitted rod or by adding a bolt and a nut in order to stiffen up the part in that particular direction. So in this case, for this foot control, if we wanted to actually 3D print it, I could actually hollow out the middle right where the foot pad would be, give it enough clearance for us to add a steel rod, and Mark Forge usually recommends a press fit clearance of between zero and two thou. Print out the part, put in the press fit rod, and I should be good to go. So definitely another thing to think about if you can't orient the part in that optimal orientation that we just did. Now with that, I was talking earlier about not being able to print that foot control in another orientation due to the fact that we're gonna have a lot of support material holding up the part. Now, support material is a necessary evil in that it allows us to print parts that would not be able to be printed. With FFF, if there is no, there's nothing underneath the material, it can't be supported by thin air. It needs some sort of material to actually hold the part into place. 
And with that, you can create very complex shapes. In this case, I just have this flat bar and I have two counterbore holes in place. When I printed it, this bottom surface was actually flat on my build bed and these counterbore holes were actually sunk upwards. Now, due to that, we needed something in between so that the material wouldn't just sink and um, fall down to the build area. And that's where the support material comes in handy. However, support material is sometimes difficult to remove and it can lead an unsightly appearance. You'll notice that over here, this bottom layer is directly off the print bed as well as the inside of this counterbore hole, but the two surfaces look drastically different. In this particular design, I wouldn't matter, I wouldn't really care too much about that surface finish because I'm probably going to put a washer and a bolt in place and hide that imperfection. But what happens if that's actually on the exterior surface and this is an end use part that we want to create? Definitely not something that we want to deal with. We could probably sand that away or coat it with something in order to hide it, but that's additional post-processing that we would need to do. So one thing that we can remember with our designs is the YHT rule. This is a steadfast rule that's used across many FDM or FFF printing technologies that allow us to determine whether or not a particular feature needs to have supports underneath it. In our case, we can look at this and determine which features require supports and which ones do not. We'll get started with the Y, and you'll notice that the Y actually has these large overhanging elements. Because these elements are at an angle that is less than 45 degrees, the previous layers as you're printing upwards actually have enough material below them to support that angle without the need of additional support material on the outside of the model, leading to a faster print with higher surface quality. That's not the same with the H and the T. You'll notice that with the H and the T, you can actually print these side posts pretty easily, but once they connect in the middle, because there's nothing directly underneath that H, you once again will need some sort of material in order to support it up and make sure that that middle section doesn't sag. Likewise, with the T, because there's these large overhangs on the outside, there will have to be support material applied. Now, that's not to say that support material is something to stay away from. A lot of times you do need it, but if you can reduce that support material applied to the part, you will help a lot in the print time because you're not having to waste time printing all of this material upwards. The surface finish quality is going to be drastically improved and you won't have to worry about additional post-processing time removing those supports. If you analyze parts that look like the YHT, it's very easy and simple to figure out what needs material or what needs support material and what doesn't. However, once you jump into more complex designs, it can become very challenging to determine if something needs support or doesn't. In this case, that handlebar riser actually has some material where we have rounded edges. How do you know if that rounded edge maintains the 45 degrees or less? Well, that's where the undercut and draft analysis tools come into play. I always like to run with these tools because it allows me to analyze the part and determine where supports would be expected. The first tool we're going to use is the undercut analysis tool. Traditionally, this is going to be used as an injection molded or a cast part to see if there's any areas inside the part that might potentially get stuck in the mold. For that, you can actually add either lifters or side cores in order to alleviate those problems. But in our case, we're going to use that a little bit differently when it comes to a 3D printed design. To get started, I'm simply going to select on the face that I would like to place our part on the build bed. And this is going to allow me to analyze the part and see any of the potential undercuts that we might have issues with. Now, in our case, we'll see three issues right off the bat. Each one of these is going to require some sort of support material in place for the print to actually print properly. What I can do with this undercut analysis tool is actually analyze the part and determine whether or not it will be simple for me to remove material. In this case, for this counterbore hole, I have two options, either pulling it out or pushing it through. So I wouldn't really be too concerned about it there. Over here, because there's only one side, we would have to pull out the material. But again, not a big concern because I'm not going to be looking at these holes. What I really like to use this tool for is any hidden features. 
So maybe if I had a hole in the corner or some sort of a fillet where support would be required, I wanna double check and make sure that I have access to this. Maybe with my hand, maybe with a pair of pliers or tweezers, just make sure that there's access to remove that support material because the last thing you wanna do is print a part that has support material that you can't actually remove. The other thing that you can do with this undercut analysis tool is determine where the surface finishes of your part are gonna be subpar. Now, in our case, these two side holes on the left don't really matter too much because I'm probably gonna have a bolt going through those. But this counterbore hole is a little bit important because you're gonna be seeing it all the time as you walk up to the bike. The bolt itself is actually gonna be fairly deep inside the hole, so everything that's in red is gonna have that suboptimal surface finish. And we'll try to figure out a way to actually solve this problem, just in a second. Now, once we validated it and kind of found out the areas to expect support material to be applied to, the next thing we're gonna do is actually use a tool called draft analysis. And this is another way of validating our design to double check and make sure that we're not missing any areas where support would be required. Again, this is a tool that's used for injection molding or cast parts to double check and make sure that there's enough angle applied to the part so it releases from the mold. In our case, we're gonna adapt this to 3D printing by first selecting on the face that we would like to build our part off of. I'll then select the angle for that print. And this is the case, I'm gonna go ahead and do 45 degrees. And I actually like to put 0.1 because if you have 45, anything that's 45 will automatically be triggered. So you don't really want to do that. Now that 45 is a general rule. Some printers you can go over that, some you can go under, but 45 is a good general rule of thumb. And then the final thing I'll do is push this gradual transition which will allow me to actually view the entire part and see where I have any potential issues that would require us to have supports. As I begin to analyze the part, these holes that appeared within the undercut analysis show up again. Again, look, we can see that we need supports on the top of each one of the holes, a little bit suboptimal surface quality. But that's not a big concern, we already know that. The one that's actually standing out to me is this front surface. Notice right here that the majority of the surface actually has a draft angle that's acceptable for 3D printing. That is until we get all the way to the left-hand side. This whole block right here actually has an angle that's over 45 degrees, which means that when we print this part, support would be required. Now that's okay, we can still print the part, but the surface quality is gonna be subpar for this particular design. We're gonna have a part that has a very smooth surface and then potentially coarse surface towards the left. Again, we could sand this off, but you know, there's additional post-processing time that's involved. So if we can catch this before we print, we can potentially save time in the printing process, save time in the post-processing, and come out with a much better part. In our case, the simple solution to this is just to increase the actual fillet diameter. And while using this draft analysis tool, you'll notice that I can actually modify the part in real time and see exactly how those changes are going to make our part actually better or worse for 3D printing. Definitely very helpful when you're actually modeling. Now, the very last thing I wanna do is actually deal with this countersunk hole or counterbore hole. The two holes on the left, I'm not gonna see, so I really don't care about the surface finish. However, this counterbore is gonna be a visual aspect. So I wanna print this in a way where we do not have supports. And a good trick of doing that is by adding a teardrop shape to the actual hole. Now you can do this in a variety of different ways. In my case, I actually just created a sketch and cut it out through the entire piece. By doing this, I can actually remove the need for supports because all of the angles for that individual hole will be self-supporting. So as we look at it now, notice that we no longer need supports at that very top face. The top face itself meets that 45 degree requirement, allowing us to print without the need for supports. The great thing about using this teardrop effect is it does not change the shape of the hole too much. It still allows you to actually add a bolt in place and it won't actually wobble around because the diameter here is gonna be less than the bolt diameter. 
very, very powerful tool that I've seen used in multiple ways. If you guys ever have any channels that you would like to add air or water through a park, this is another way of adding these channels without the need of support or removing support material. Now, in our case, we've made these changes. Our part should print a little bit faster and with a little less support because of what we've just accomplished. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at another tool that's found inside of SolidWorks, and that's the insert part command. Now, the beauty of working with 3D printing parts is we have the ability to create very complex designs without the need to worry too much about the manufacturing method. Now, in our case, we actually have this motorcycle handlebar riser that's mounted to the front of the bike. It also has an arm extending outwards to hold the gauge cluster into place. Traditionally, when you're manufacturing this part, these would be two separate components because they're too hard to manufacture as one. However, because we're using a 3D printer, we can actually kind of bend some of the rules. And we're gonna be doing this with the insert part command. As I jump back into SolidWorks, to use the insert part, I'm simply gonna to go to the insert dropdown menu and click on part file. Next, I'll browse to the part I wish to use, select it, and then roll down below. I personally prefer the insert part method because it gives me the ability to choose what type of information I would like to include while inserting that part directly into our solid party. In my case, I'm just gonna use the solid bodies option, and at the very bottom, we'll choose to locate the part. From here, I'll click OK, and begin locating it. You'll notice that very similar commands will appear that we normally would see inside of an assembly to locate these two parts together. By adding different constraints, I'm quickly and easily able to select on the individual elements that I wish to mate, and add concentric mates or even parallel mates to the individual surfaces in order to have these two parts merge back together. At this point in time, I now have two separate bodies housed inside of the exact same part file, very close to what I ultimately want out of this piece. Now, what I can do from here is actually use a Boolean operation to combine these two parts together as one. To do this, I'm gonna to go to the Insert dropdown menu, click on Features, and click Combine. I'll now select on the two individual bodies and hit OK. What this will do is merge those two bodies into one, allowing me to print this as one solid part. Very good for our, what we need, but if I look closely at it, it's not perfect. We have some various gaps and spaces around the part that traditionally you would need when you're milling this out for two separate bodies. But I don't really want that in my particular design. So we need to find a way to quickly and easily remove any of those gaps. And this is where a tool called Delete Face is going to come in handy. In order to run with this tool, I'm actually going to go ahead and roll back to a time where these two bodies were still separated from one another. If you haven't used this before, what you can do is hover at the very bottom of our feature manager tree, grab this blue bar, and roll it back into time. This bar is called a rollback bar because it allows you to access different states or previous states of your part file whenever you wish. Now, I will then go ahead and remove our mounting arm by simply hovering over it and hitting the tab key to hide. Now I can use that delete face command. The delete face is very powerful because it allows me to solve this particular design issue without having to create additional features or sketches that may be complicated like lofts or extrude sketches. To access delete face, I'm simply gonna right click on the face I wish to delete, scroll to the very bottom of our shortcut menu and find the face folder. Next, I'll click on delete, and all that's left to do is simply select on the faces I would like to delete out of this area. In my case, all the faces of this individual pocket. Now, we do have the delete option, and this will permanently delete the faces, resulting in a surface body. However, I can also use the delete and patch, which will automatically 
merge the pace faces in their natural boundary direction. So planar faces will go in a planar direction, cylindrical faces will go in a cylindrical direction. From here, I can click OK, and you'll notice that that particular region will automatically disappear. I can now go to the very bottom of my tree and use the rollback bar to roll back to the existing state. And I have one body that's now merged together without any of those unsightly gaps that we had previously. Very, very powerful tool, especially when you're using it. I use the lead face a lot for troubleshooting parts as well. So it's a good tool to have in your tool belt. Going back to that foot control method, we can actually take a quick look at this and see. With the foot control, if I have any components that are laying on the left-hand side of the piece, it makes it very hard and challenging for me to print due to the fact that I need additional support material below it in order to support that piece. This support material in this particular scenario actually doubles the entire amount of material used for this print, increasing the cost and increasing the time to produce this part. And sometimes it's much easier just to split the part into two than to you know, have that support material in place. The tool that we'll use next is actually the split tool. And the split tool allows me to use either a face or a plane to break apart into two separate bodies. In order to access this tool, all we're gonna do is go to the insert command, click on features, and select on split. From here, I can select on a face or I can select on a plane in order to cut my bodies. We'll click on cut and choose the two bodies I would like to be separate. From here, I'll click on OK. And now we have two separate bodies that we can now work with. In order to have these as two separate part files, the only less thing to do is simply right click on the solid bodies folder and choose to save the bodies out as two separate parts. When doing so, we can literally left click on the save icon directly next to the solid bodies, and it's gonna accept the file name for the actual part file. We can create an assembly at the exact same point in time. And once we do this, everything will actually be linked together into one master part file. Now this gives me the ability to have one file drive those two separate 3D printed parts allowing me to have everything kept in place and print all the parts that much easier and faster because I don't have to worry about having any supports. So you can see in here, we have that assembly of the two split files. We have the lower com component and we have the foot control itself that are split into two separate bodies, making it easier to print directly off into separate areas. Now, the next thing I want to take a look at is physical considerations with 3D printers. And this is something that we run into a lot with CNC machines. So for a CNC, the smallest tool diameter that we have in our shop is going to determine what the smallest negative feature is that we can create inside of our part file. Now, this is much the same with a 3D printer, where the nozzle diameter is actually going to determine what the smallest feature is that we can print. When you're working with 3D printers, a lot of the times there's gonna be a couple of wall layers on the outside of the part to actually strengthen up the design. And when you're working with a Mark Forge brand printer, you have the ability to add continuous fiber strands, whether that be fiberglass or carbon fiber to reinforce and make the part stronger. Now, when you're doing this, you do need to have enough clearance in order for that material to run through the entire piece. In our case, Mark Forge actually recommends at least two millimeters of clearance in the part in order to have all that material run effectively. In our 3D parts, we don't wanna run into an issue where the part fails because our surfaces or our walls are too close together for the parts to behave. And that's where we can actually run a thickness analysis or jump into our design for manufacturing tool once again. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at DFM Express. Now, I said earlier, I really like this tool because it makes very quick work of trying to determine whether or not certain areas of the part are not up to our particular design standards. 
In this case, what we're going to do is activate that tool once again by going to our Evaluate option, clicking on the far right-hand side of the screen, and choosing the DFM Express Analysis Wizard. Now this time around, I'm actually going to jump into the Settings menu because I don't want to use the Mill and Drill option. I actually want to use Injection Molding. This is going to allow me to analyze all of the wall thicknesses of the part to determine if any of them do not fall into my particular design criteria. In our case, I'm just going to use two millimeters as the minimum wall thickness. We'll click on Run and let SOLIDWORKS DFM Express analyze the part to determine if we have any potential issues. In our case, if you notice inside of the rules, we actually have a maximum rules, which I don't really care about for this particular purpose. I only care about any of the walls that don't meet the minimum thickness. In our case, you'll actually notice that there is one, and that's exactly where we had that teardrop shape appear. With DFM Express, it's going to allow you to see what the thickness of the wall should be and what it actually is inside of our part. Now, analyzing this part file, Notice that those two walls are extremely close together, and it might be extremely difficult to add material inside properly. So we need to come up with a solution. One great way of solving this problem is with a tool very similar to the Delete Face tool. In this case, it's going to be Move Face. It's found the exact same way. Simply right-click on the face we wish to move, click on the drop-down menu, go to the Face subfolder, and select on Move. What Move Face will do is allow you to move that individual face along with any of the connecting features in the direction you wish. In our case, I'm going to be modifying this in the X direction, so I'll type in 2 millimeters. You'll notice that it automatically shows you a preview of where that face would now lie. From here, I can click OK, and the face will be kicked out that individual distance. Notice here, there was no need for me to do any additional editing to the part. These direct editing tips are very fast and easy to modify the parts to our proper design criteria. Now, when I go back into our DFM Express and run the analysis, we'll notice that we should not get any designs that do not meet our minimum design criteria allowing us to continue on with our design without worrying about a failed print. Now, the final tool I want to talk about is a tool called Print 3D. Now, this is a tool that's been around inside of SOLIDWORKS for many years, and it's a tool that you can actually slice your individual parts from and send directly into various 3D printers. Now, Print 3D is a good slicer, but a lot of the times these other external 3D printing companies such as HP and MarkForge actually have their own software that you'll add your STL files to. Now, even though I might use those other software, Print 3D can be very beneficial, allowing me to double check and make sure that certain design criteria are held in check. In order to use Print 3D, what we're gonna do is simply hit the File and Print 3D menu down below. Inside of here, you'll actually have the ability to choose what printer you would like to run with. In our case, I have the MarkForge X7, but you'll notice that SOLIDWORKS has almost every single 3D printing company and 3D printer on the market already loaded into the Print 3D database, allowing you to manage all the printers that you have in staff. This will update all the dimensions of the printer, allowing you to choose the orientation of the part. In my case, I'm gonna choose the bottom face of the piece. Now, with Print 3D, you can use this to determine whether or not the size of your part will fit inside of the 3D printer. And like we saw, I actually had to reorient the orientation of the part in order to make sure that the force was being applied in the right direction, which once again, could mean that the part diameters, part dimensions might be able to fit, but not the orientation inside the printer. I can move the part around into the orientation I would like by changing the angle, changing the dimensions, and we can also scale or modify any of the qualities. These are very helpful if you're trying to print directly from Print 3D. But if you're using Print 3D as a validation tool, you'll see underneath the Previews tab, there's a variety of other tools that you can use as well. The first of which is you can use this Build Analysis tool to show any faces that would typically require supports. 
This is very similar to using the draft analysis tool that we used earlier in that any faces that require supports are gonna show up in green. So notice right here, these bottom inside holes still show up in green, whereas the teardrop shape down below does not. Now, I prefer using the draft analysis tool because I can actually model with draft analysis turned on and see how those modeling changes actually affect the part. But this is great as a final test before you actually jump to the 3D printer. The other thing that you can use this tool for is to actually show the orientation of the layer lines of your print. So tying this back into our Simulation Express and laying or aligning the force directly parallel to our 3D printing bed, you can actually see that we can turn on these show striation lines. This is going to give me the ability to double check and reinforce that the direction of the force is going to be applied parallel to the direction of the layer lines for our 3D printed part. Very, very helpful when you're actually working with 3D printers. You'll also see that there's a thickness and a gap analysis, very similar to what we use that uh, Design for Manufacturing Express tool for. I always like to use Print 3D as a final step in the validation process, just because I can run through this very quickly and determine whether or not these parts are going to work the first time on my printer. All right, so finally, I just wanted to do a quick run through of all the tools that we've covered. So one of the major tools is Design for Manufacturing Express, very powerful tool. You saw a couple of different uses for it in order to analyze your parts. We also talked about SimExpress to validate and make sure that our parts are going to hold up inside of our designs. Geometry analysis to determine whether or not we have small gaps or small errors in our parts. Thickness analysis to make sure that we're able to apply material in between exterior faces. Undercut analysis and draft analysis to double check and make sure that our part does not require supports in faces that need, um, you know, are visible to the end use. So with that, and print 3D. So with that, we've talked about quite a lot of tools that you can use inside of SolidWorks that, you know what, they're not directly designed for 3D printing, but can be beneficial in the 3D printing process. Now, before I let you guys go, I just really quickly want to post this slide up. There is a COVID-2019 um, printer relief effort going on out there. So for those of you who have printers that might not be using them currently, I would highly recommend reaching out to any of these websites and signing up just saying that you have a printer available to print out any face mask or any other medical needs to help out all these medical personnel. We'll actually send this out as an additional handout, and this is going to be included inside of the PowerPoint PDF that we've included in here. HP, Mark Forge, and the National Institute of Health all have different relief sites that you can use in order to sign up and help with this COVID-19 response. But with that, thank you all for attending this webinar. I hope you guys all learned a little bit of information about using SOLIDWORKS within a 3D printing sense. Now, there's a variety of different tools that are found inside of SOLIDWORKS, as well as different manufacturing, simulation, and managing options. And we always like to just do a quick poll to see if anyone's interested in receiving any additional information and what that would be about or for. So I'll launch that poll very quickly, and then I'll take questions after that poll is complete. All right, so looks like we have a fair amount of, of responses. Uh, looks like a lot of re uh, requests for design for manufacturing, design for additive manufacturing, as well as for Mark Forge. So I'd like to thank you all for attending. Uh, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to ask. I'll be on the line for uh, about 10 to 15 minutes to answer any questions uh, if need be. Hey Mark, this is Tim. Can you hear me okay? I, I can. So Mike has a question, it's a pretty good one. Um, and the question is, are there tools in SOLIDWORKS to automatically fillet edges in the print Z direction? Maybe not all edges at once, but similar to how you can fillet a face, you'd like to be able to click a face and fillet all the vertical edges. There, there is a way there's a 
there, there is one that we can use that um, might potentially help out. Um, that is actually built directly inside of the fillet tool. So inside of the features tab, you can actually click on the fillet option. And there's a little checkbox not a lot of people usually turn on. And this is actually the show selection toolbar. What this is going to allow me to do is select on one individual edge and then SOLIDWORKS will predict additional edges that we may want to fill it at the same time. So in our case, if I click on one of these edges on the side, it'll hover over and you know fill up that one edge. But you'll notice there's a toolbar that hovers over to the right-hand side of my menu. What I can do is actually hover over these various options and SOLIDWORKS is actually gonna try and predict where else you would like to apply fillets. They'll show up in this pink color. I can go through all these options and see if any of them will work properly for me. Now, there might not be one that just go, does all the edges in the Z direction, but I can try to choose the one that's close enough for me. So in this case, maybe doing all these 11 external edges. I'll modify the value to be something small. And you'll notice in here, instead of me having to manually select on every single edge, SOLIDWORKS did the work for me, selecting on 12 edges and allow me to fill it and continue on with my design process. Yeah, that's awesome. That's exactly what I was thinking, Mark. Um, you know, Mike, you might just get portions of it and you can always remove edges from that definition. So if it gets too many, just reselect and it'll take them right out of that. Mark, I have another question from Craig, and he says uh, the FDA analysis was for solid material. Most 3D printers do an infill, and the parts are not 100% solid. The FDA would be very wrong. Is there a way to utilize a real 3D part that uses walls and infill? There, so there, there are some companies that are coming out with simulation technology for infills. Um, there's a couple things that we can do currently. So Mark Forge is trying to make a, a, a simulation technology. It's not out just yet. They're still working on it. But you could potentially actually model in an infill directly inside of your 3D printed part. Um, now, the way to do that, we actually have a video that's uh, being posted on to our YouTube channel. Um, however, you could actually draw out a series of individual edges, um, pattern them in one direction, and kind of mimic your infill pattern and then apply surface faces to the top and the bottom. That's going to be kind of the closest that you can get currently. Um, again, it's going to be an assumption, but it's not going to be totally like what an infill pattern would you know, be in real life. Cool. Uh, Tim, are there any uh, other questions? Okay. Well, I, I will stay on the line for a little bit. So if you guys do have any questions, please feel free to shoot me a chat message or uh, set, um, you know, turn on your mic, ask a question that way. But with that, I'd like to thank you all for attending this webinar. Uh, feel free to go back to our webinars page on our Hawkridge Systems website to see any additional webinars that you might be interested in sitting in on and uh, listening to. Other thing to note is we will be handing out a couple of pieces of information, such as a copy of the PowerPoint PDF and a packet about the different design validation products that we have available to us. So with that, thank you all for attending and please feel free, please have a great rest of your day. Hey Mark, we've got a few more questions that are still coming in here. Craig has okay. a follow-up question, and I wanted to I wanted to share with Craig that sometimes these simulation tools can be really valuable to find trends in the uh, in the design without necessarily giving the exact answer. 
because uh, absolutely the you know the geometry the the shape that Mark was using there is not 100% faithfully representative of the 3D printed file. But uh, Craig's next question is: He'd like to get a copy of the material file for the Onyx material. Is that something, Mark? You can send him afterwards. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I can send over um, you know a, a copy of that. Um, a lot of that those material properties are actually based directly off of the Markforge website. But I can send you a quick copy of what I've inserted there as well. Um, there are a couple of different websites you can actually access to uh, access a different additional material. Um, Tim, do you remember the the website? Um, I think it's like Material Hub or Material Centric, where Matt, you can Matt Matt Webb is one I've used for quite a long time. Um, Matt Base Campus Plastics Portal is another one I've used. Um, and then there's also access to a wide range of materials right inside SolidWorks uh, as well as SolidWorks Simulation. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the the default materials that SolidWorks comes with are extremely plentiful. And you can get very accurate results. Sometimes when you're using these newer materials such, such as Onyx, all the material properties aren't in place. So I definitely will send you out that material file that I used for that simulation. Yeah, that's right. There's also the SolidWorks material portal that you can find inside the material definition dialog box. connor has got a question here, Mark. Uh, he says, has that part been printed or do you have any examples in the office to show? Maybe you could run over to that wall behind you and grab a couple samples and hold them up to the camera for Connor. And Connor, we totally invite you out to one of our um, digital manufacturing labs. You've got a number of these positioned around, you know, strategically positioned around the country. And we love to play show and tell. Um, one of the more fun things that we get to do. So I totally invite you to come on out and um, have a look. Yeah, no, I mean, for, for sure, we're, we're extremely fortunate to be surrounded by all of these printers. Um, the part itself actually printed out uh, about a week ago. So it's gonna be hard to see on the webcam, but you'll notice here, yeah, the entire 3D print. And that part's off the Mark Forge machine using the Onyx material. Correct. Yeah. So it's actually printed with the Onyx material, and I actually reinforced certain areas of the part with a carbon fiber continuous strand. Uh, didn't really talk about that because that's actually in the Iger software that's on the Mark Forge side. But with this particular part, the two outside faces. So if I'm, it's kind of hard to see on the webcam, but the two outside faces on this side and as well as this side, both have actual carbon fiber reinforcement running down the sides. So as I load up the part. It's very, very difficult for me to bend. So in this case, you can't actually tell I can't bend that at all, putting as much force on it as possible. But yeah, of course, we have you know various parts that are found uh, within our digital manufacturing labs. Um, there's a ton across the country. Uh, feel free to check out our website. We actually have a list of all of the labs available. We have various open houses, so you can come by, check out the printers, and check out the parts that are created directly on the printers inside of our labs. Oh, awesome. Well, sounds like Connor is somewhat local. Um, it'd be exciting to have him come on out and take a look. Oh, awesome. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, keep an eye on our events calendar. Um, whenever we start opening up our um, lab again for our open houses, please feel free to stop by. There's always a lot of um, different um, events going on, different seminars about printing, different technologies designed for, designed for additive manufacturing, and you can just check out all of the various printers that are through at the lab. Awesome, yeah, th thank you all for attending. Um, if you guys do have any additional questions, please feel free to uh, email one of us uh, and ask away.